Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, morning and welcome to Dewsbury Evangelical Church's morning worship service where we come and we gather and we worship our triune God, the Father who adopts, the Son who gave himself for us, and the Spirit who comforts and helps us, the God of love. This is who we come to worship this morning. This is who we come to worship every Sunday. And it's a great thing that we can do that. In fact, uh, let me start by uh, reading some scripture uh, that points to one of the reasons why we, why, why we can worship the Lord, or one of the reasons, and it's found in Job. If you're struggling, you're coming this morning and you're struggling, you're coming this morning that you're, you're hurting, you're coming this morning and you're, you're full of grief or, 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 or your situation is just is getting down on you, that, then remember these wonderful words from Job. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Aren't they wonderful words? Wonderful words to stir us, wonderful words to remind us that this is the God that we can worship, that because our Redeemer lives, because the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, and rose from the grave, we will see him one day. And because of that, we have many reasons, many reasons to worship our triune God this morning. So let's, let's do just that, but let's come. Let's come as people of the risen king. Let's come uh, and see the king of love and sing two songs. Come people of the risen king, and then come and see, come and see. Let's stand and sing if we're able to worship together.
Come and see the king of love. It. Let's come and pray to our God together. <laughs> Heavenly Father, triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you that we can come and we can worship you as people of the risen King, as people of the king of love 
We thank you that we can come to you, the God Almighty, the God All-Powerful, the God who is awe-inspiring and glorious, and we can worship. Lord, we thank you that we can worship you because of your great salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the redemption uh, that has bought us at a cost, at the cost of the blood of your own son, to buy us back, to redeem us, Lord, from our slavery to sin. And Lord, we thank you that we are justified, that we are declared not guilty. Lord, we thank you that uh, that means we are rescued. We are rescued from uh, the, the, the reality of our own sin and the judgment that we deserve. And Lord, we thank you that that rescue means we are transformed. We thank you that your Holy Spirit has opened up our eyes if we're Christians here this morning and has given us new life, new birth, a new heart to see you and be able to turn to you and repent and believe in you. And as we do, we praise you and we thank you that you are the God that has adopted us as your children. We praise you and thank you for this great salvation, a salvation that doesn't just stop at, at justification, at, at adoption. Lord, we praise you and we thank you that we are reconciled to you, that we can have peace with you. And we praise you and thank you that one day when Christ returns, we will know you forever. We will be glorified. And Lord, you will be with us forever in a new heavens and a new earth, Lord, where we will have new resurrection bodies. And Lord, we praise you and thank you that that is the hope that we have as Christians. And so we praise you and thank you that together with Job, we can say, I know that my Redeemer lives. Help us to hold on to these truths, Lord. Help us to cling on to these truths and, and forgive us for the fact that so often we wander away from them. And even though we have this magnificent gospel, even though we have this magnific magnificent salvation, we, we, in our rebellion and sin, so often wander, so often do our own thing, so often uh, 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 seek to, to please ourselves. And so, Lord, we pray this morning that you, by your Spirit, would help us to look to you afresh, to look to you again. That at the beginning of a new week, you would reorientate us, reorientate our loves and our desires and our affections so that they are upon you. And as we do so, we help us to remember that your salvation, this wonderful reality of rescue and transformation, is done so not at our, in our own ability, not at something that we have done for ourselves, but because of your amazing grace. So may we always look to you and your salvation and your grace, we pray. May that stir us to worship you more, Lord, not just on a Sunday, but throughout the week. For your glory, Lord, we pray these things. Amen. 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 Well, children, it's, it's time uh, for the children's talk now. So if you want to uh, come to the front, that would be really, really helpful, I'm sure, for Beth. And Beth is going <laughs> to do the talk uh, this morning. Hello, hello. You might need your hands, Ezra. You might need your hands today. Gobble them up quick. Morning. Hello. Now, last week we were continuing in the Bible book that we've started reading together. So here's our book, big book, to remind us what it's called Acts well remember and we were saying at the beginning of Acts we find Jesus's disciples listening Jesus's disciples Jesus's follower in a room together and we asked this question last week 
Who are they waiting for? Who are they waiting for? Now, can anybody remember who the disciples are waiting for? Okay. Sophie. God, that's right. Now, where was Jesus? He'd gone back to heaven, that's right. They were waiting for God, the Holy Spirit. Hang on a minute. This is getting confusing. Okay, we know about Jesus and we know that Jesus is God. God become man, God, God with us. Okay, but Jesus went back to heaven, didn't he? And now God is coming again, but this time God the Holy Spirit. Oh dear, my brain could get in a bit of a twist with all that. Could yours? That's why today I have brought my remote control and I am pressing pause. I'm pressing pause on our Acts book at the moment and we are going to think and explore a little bit more about God because although we've learned a lot about God already we have haven't we there is more because God is more can you say that together God is more we could do some actions like this we could say God is more can we do that God is more. That's right. Okay. Now, let's whisper that. God is more. Let's get ready to shout that. God is more. Okay. Now, I said I was pressing pause today, and I'm also going to press pause on you. So I usually like you to tell me lots of things and to give me lots of answers, but today... I'm pressing pause and I want you to listen because God is more and we need to be ready to stop and just listen to find out about God. Psalm 46 says, be still and know that I am God. So can we practice being really still and really quiet? Okay. And our mouths need to be really still and really quiet too, so we'd better zip them up. Can we zip them up? Mm -hmm. okay. Sorry, I need to unzip mine because I need to speak, don't I, silly me? Okay, good. But I want to check some things with you. Okay, so I'm going to give you a yes, no stick. All right, I'm give everyone a yes, no stick. Green for go, for yes. Red for no, for stop. So red for no, green for yes. Okay, everyone have a stick. There we go. All right. Stick over there. And Abigail can have a stick. There you go, chicken. All right. Now then, I need a stick as well. Let's practice with our sticks and see if they work. Okay, so are we zipped? We're still zipped? Yeah? Okay. Show me a green for yes. I want to see your greens. Okay, to practice because you have to see the red and I have to see the green. Right, show me your reds for no. Okay, this is good. Right, now then. I'm going to ask you a question and I want you to answer with your stick. All right, you ready? Is it raining outside now? Oh, what are we answering with? Zip, zip, zip. All right, it takes a bit of practice. How do we answer? Show me your answer. Is it sunny outside? Well done, well done. Okay, now then, I'm going to ask you a question. You might have different answers. Do you like bananas? Okay. Oh, everyone's a banana lover here. Okay. Right then. Uh, are you sitting down at the moment? Are you standing up? Turn your little stick around. There we go. Now, let's ask some questions about God and see if we can use our sticks to do that. You're doing very well. It's tricky. It's tricky. Um, okay, but don't worry if you don't know the answer because there's always more to learn about God because God is more. Oh, you can't say that because you're zipped up. Should we ask the adults to say it together, see how well they do? Okay, adults all together. God is more. Okay, they are still awake and listening. Okay, some questions about God. Does God have a start? Does God have a beginning? Look at my stick. Okay. 
No. Does God have an end? Will he come to a finish? No, no. He has no beginning and no end because he's eternal. He's forever. So is God forever? Okay. Is God good? Is God good all the time? Is God good all the time always? Yes. Okay. Is Jesus God? Oh, look at my stick. That's right. Okay, he is. Is Jesus a man? Oh, yes, that's a yes as well. He's God become man, so he's totally God and totally man. All right, we're getting it. Okay, what about the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit God? We learned that last week, didn't we? Okay, now, is God in heaven? Mm -hmm. uh, is God here with us? Oh, that's a yes as well. Okay, he's getting a bit mind blowing, isn't it? Is God everywhere? Yes. Okay, now, here's a bit of a different question, right? Tell me with your stick, do you know what shape this is called? What's this shape called? Do you know the answer to that? Don't tell me, just tell me. Do you know with your stick? Yes or no? Right now then, I'm going to ask one person, one person to unzip themselves and tell me what this shape is called. Okay, Ezra, can you unzip? Mm -hmm. Right, what's this shape called? Triangle. It's a triangle. Okay, is it that one again? Okay, it's a triangle. Okay, it's a triangle because it has how many sides? Now, can you show me with your fingers how many sides? Can you see? Three sides. This is lovely. Okay, three sides and three corners as well. It's a triangle. Now, did you know that this little bit at the beginning, the tri, means Three. Okay, so like a triangle, if you've got a tricycle or a trike at home, it's got three wheels. Can you show me three? Yeah, somebody's got a trike. Uh, there's a tripod here and that's got one, two, three legs. Okay. So oh, why am I going on about triangles and tripods and tricycles? Well, you might have heard someone use a tri word about God. Have you heard Mark use this word? Triune. Triune. If you listen carefully, you'll hear him use that word about God. Triune. Our God is a triune God because our God is three. Hang on a minute. Answer me this question. Quick. Is there more than one God? With your sticks? I want to see that red. No, there is only one God. Phew, we knew that, didn't we? But our God, our one God, has three persons. He's a God in three persons. And we know that, don't we? Because we talk about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Okay? One God, three persons. Okay. How many persons are you? Give me a finger. Show me your fingers. Just the one. You're just one person, aren't you? Okay. But God, God is more. Okay. God is one God, but he's three persons. Now, show me with your stick. Do you understand that? I'm going to show you my stick. I don't understand that. Because God is more. He's always more. The more I learn about God, the more I realize God is more. Is there anyone else like God? No. Our sticks say no. No one compares to God. Isaiah chapter 46 says, God says, remember this. Remember this one. I am God and there is no other I am God and there is none like me. So we can't understand God fully, but we can worship God. 
we can praise God and we can say to him, who is like you, O oh Lord? And the answer is, unzip, no one. Okay, now we're going to praise God now. We're going to pray to him and tell him how amazing he is. And you can unzip your mouth to say aloud, amen at the end. Okay, let's pray. Our God, you are so big. You have no beginning, no end. You are amazing. And the more we learn about you, the more we know that we don't understand you and we can't know everything about you because you are always more. We love you and we love that you are so amazing. We always want more. Help us to want that more in you, God. Help us to praise you every day and say, who compares to you? In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That was super. Back to your seats. Thank you so much, Beth. It's time to read God's word now. So if you have your Bibles with you, uh, please turn to Acts. We're not hitting, well, we did hit pause on Acts for a couple of weeks. We're now back into Acts. Uh, series in Acts, turning the world upside down, and we're going to read verses 12 to the end of the chapter, verse to, to verse 26 of Acts chapter 1, and Jenny is going to come and read God's word for us. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, <clears throat> Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, May this place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it's necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph, called Barsabbas, also known as Justus, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the eleven apostles. Amen. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, before we look at uh, God's Word to go together and before the children leave for Bible Explorers, let's uh, sing again. Uh, let's sing. Uh, As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. Let's sing this not just as a song, but as a prayer. Uh, may we sing this actually believing. Do we believe? I, I, I often say this when we sing this 
song to myself and to you. Do I believe those lines? You alone are my heart's desire. And I long to worship you. Let's stand and sing together. sits as the children are leaving for Bible Explorers following Nathan and Beth. Uh, please have your Bibles open at Acts chapter 1. Uh, I say it quite often, but that's because I believe it. It is always easier to follow along when you've got your Bible open. So please have your Bible open. Even if that's on your phone, I won't think you're texting someone else. I believe that you're reading your Bible. So please have your Bible open. And as we open God's Word together and look at God's Word together, we need God's help. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word. We thank you that you have given us your Word, Lord. It reveals more of you and more of the truths about you and what you have done. And Lord, we pray now that you would help us by your Spirit to, to understand it, but not just to understand it, to to apply what we learn from it to our hearts and to our lives and to this week, Lord, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. How do ordinary people do extraordinary things? Uh, I wonder, have you ever heard of that expression? Are ordinary people doing extraordinary things? Apparently, not that, that, that we really care that much, but apparently it was coined by a basketball coach in the 80s. Apparently the tie was scored. There was seven seconds uh, to go, and, and the coach said to his players, you know, ordinary people can do extraordinary things. I didn't actually check to see whether they won the match, but I, I, I assume they did. But you know, that's, that's, that's something... Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. I think that's something that really perfectly encaptures the apostles. In one sense, the world was turned upside down by these 
ordinary people or seemingly ordinary people. And we, and we get a list of their names, don't we, in verse 13, after the ascension. So after the, the Lord went back up into heaven, they, they walked back, we're told, just over half a mile's walk from Mount Olives into Jerusalem. So that, that's what a Sabbath day walk means, just over half a mile. And they're there to wait, aren't they, for what the Lord has said. So they, they're there to wait for the promised Holy Spirit. And as they're waiting, Luke just names them. He names them in verse 13. We see them uh, named. So we, we have, uh, starting with Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and, and Judas, son of James. Many of them ordinary people who had ordinary jobs. Fishermen tax collector might not have been a job that people liked but it was a very fairly ordinary job many of them we don't really know much about but jesus chose them as ordinary people and trained them and discipled them which probably helps answer the question, how did these ordinary people do extraordinary things? Uh, but I, I believe this passage gives us four more ingredients uh, to see how, how these ordinary apostles uh, went on to do extraordinary things. Uh, uh, and we see how, how the apostles really did change the world. And we see it in verses 12 to 26. They, they did so, we will see, through their readiness to pray through responding to a fallen leader, through reliance on scripture, and through resurrection witness. This is how the ordinary apostles did extraordinary things. And as ordinary people here, I presume we're all ordinary people here, I believe we can learn a thing or two from them. Uh, by the way, there is another factor that is so important that we'll be looking at it next week that explains why these ordinary people did extraordinary things, and that's because the Holy Spirit came and dwelled in them. It is vital, and we will look at that. So please uh, have that in the back of your minds, but we're going to look at these four things together this morning, starting with their readiness to pray. Uh, I don't know if anybody have heard of a guy called E.M. Bounds, uh, he loved writing books on prayer. Uh, and one of his books on prayer was this book called The Necessity of Prayer. He had these books, they like The Power of Prayer, The Necessity of Prayer, The Purpose of Prayer, things like that. Uh, and, and his book on the necessity of prayer, he writes this. The life, power, and glory of the church is prayer. The life of its members is dependent on prayer, and the presence of God is secured and retained by prayer. He then goes on to write, without it, the church is lifeless and powerless. They're strong words, aren't they? The necessity of prayer can be found throughout Acts. We'll see that uh, throughout Acts. In fact, another writer uh, has counted that prayer is mentioned or, or done 31 times in Acts. And you can see it in 20 out of the 28 chapters in Acts. So Acts is saturated in prayer. And we see this in our passage, almost bookended by prayer. We see it in verse 14, and then and we'll see it in verses 24 to 25. And in verse 14, we come across the, the first of many cases of, of group, or what we call as Christians, corporate prayer. Christians coming together in prayer. We read, don't we, in verse 14. Uh, just read it with me. Uh, verse 14, uh, we, we read, They all join together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. The, the apostles joined together. It wasn't just the apostles praying. It was the women praying as well, likely the women that, that supported Jesus' ministry that are mentioned in Luke chapter 8 and verses 2 to 3. And, and his mother, his mom's still alive. And his brothers, who at one point didn't believe. We, we know that he had four brothers, and, and seemingly now they believed. We have two of their letters in James and Jude in the New Testament. And then in verse 15, we, we see as well that 120 believers in Jerusalem uh, seemingly as well, I think, joined together in prayer. So we have these big group of people 
coming together, joining together constantly in prayer. But just note that they, they all joined together. That means they were united. They were all together in this. And they did it constantly. That is, they did it persistent. They were persistent together praying. You get a clear sense in Acts that the earliest believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, led by the apostles, made corporate prayer a priority. Just let that hit home. Uh, let that just maybe sink in. And as you let that hit home and maybe sink in, it, it might make you feel a little bit uncomfortable as I ask these questions. How many of us make praying together a priority? How many of us make our prayer meeting a priority? I know that there are legitimate reasons for why you can't get to a prayer meeting. Illness, looking after loved ones, working, I know. But, but just think about this. Do you make the prayer meeting a priority? Or do you make watching TV on a Wednesday evening, playing computer games on a Wednesday evening, a priority? How many of us think the members meeting this Wednesday, which is really important, I hope you can come if you're a member, more important than the prayer meeting that is usually on on a second and on on a fourth Wednesday evening? We're all ordinary people here. But extraordinary things can happen through the prayers of ordinary people joining together to pray. If you want proof of that, if you're a Christian here uh, this morning, then it is very likely that somebody prayed for you before you became a Christian. And, and perhaps very likely that somebody prayed for you in a prayer meeting that you would become a Christian. That somebody prayed that a miracle would happen in your life. That somebody would pray that you who were dead in your sins and transgressions were made alive in Christ. So that you could see that the Lord is your Savior and repent and believe in Him because He's died for your sins and risen from the grave to give you life. Somebody prayed. Perhaps likely the church prayed, even for you here this morning. And historically, if you look at the, the revivals, in church history, so the, the large groups of people becoming Christians, one of the key elements undergirding it all is often the people coming together and joining constantly in prayer. God can use our prayers. God can use our prayer meetings to do extraordinary things. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? If it was vital for the apostles and the early church, it has to be vital for us too. To join constantly together in prayer. And perhaps uh, though praying through praying, it, 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 perhaps although we don't know for sure, it became clear then to Peter and the apostles that though they were waiting for the promised Holy Spirit, that something actually needed to be done in the meantime. Perhaps as they were praying, God just enlightened them the fact that, it, that although they're waiting for the Holy Spirit, something had to be done before the Holy Spirit came. Because there was an elephant in the room. A big, giant elephant in the room, which meant that they needed to respond to an issue of fallen leadership. Which is our second point this morning. These ordinary apostles did extraordinary things because they put their house in order through responding to a fallen leader. Judas. It's a dirty word, isn't it? It's not a word in our language that we would use to compliment someone. 
In fact, I very much think, if you looked at, 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 at the census, I very much doubt that you'll see any sons called Judas in the West. Why? Because it is synonymous with Judas who betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a Judas, you've done the unforgivable. Sometimes we, we use that word, don't we, to describe somebody who's done something horrible, unforgivable, something that, 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 that is so bad. And we've all probably heard of church leaders falling publicly, haven't we? And through scandalous means. And in a sense, Judas here is a prototype or a warning shot that reveals a, a very scandalous and public betrayal. And Peter and Luke's response, I think, offers us some wisdom in how to deal with the downfall of a public leader. As Luke says in verse 19, uh, uh, everyone in Jerusalem heard about this. Everybody in Jerusalem had heard about uh, Judas's death. And, and no doubt because of that, they'd heard of Judas's betrayal as well. This was, a, this was a public disaster. This was a PR disaster for the apostles. And so something needed to be done. So what do you do when someone, a leader, is caught in such a scandalous and public fall from ministry? Well, first of all, you own up to it. You own up to it. And again, I wonder whether the way Peter handles it may offer wisdom for us all, because in front of the 120 believers in Jerusalem, he admits what must have been very painful, very embarrassing, and very shameful in verses 16 to 17. He says, Judas, he names him, Judas served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. This is what he did. And in verse 17, Peter then says, and he was one of our number. He shared in his ministry. He didn't downplay Judas's role. He didn't just say, oh, Judas was just part of the money. He, just, he was in charge of the money. He didn't have a massive role. Uh, you know, he, he, was just the, he was just the accountant. No, he said, no, Jesus was part of our ministry. He doesn't try and downplay. He makes it clear what Judas has done and what Judas's role was. He's honest and owns up to the facts. In fact, Luke adds a little bit more detail in between Peter's speech. Uh, you see it in verses 18 to 19. Just to strike home Judas's betrayal, he even calls Judas wicked, doesn't he? Jude, what des describes what Jesus has done as uh, Judas has done as wicked by showing Judas uh, that he'd received payment uh, for his betrayal. And then he, he describes this gruesome death. And it really is a gruesome death. Describes Judas uh, falling headlong. Uh, that, that, that could be translated, he swelled up. And his body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. I mean, that isn't a good way to go, is it? And if you match this with Matthew's account that he hung himself, you can imagine the body in a hot climate rotting and bloating until it burst apart. And the point is that describing the horrific nature of his death would, in the eyes of the people at the time, point to Judas's wickedness, point to his shameful act of betrayal, and see in his death that this was God's judgment on him. And Luke doesn't pull any punches in describing his death. He and Peter... They own up to this horrible thing that Judas did. They don't brush it under the carpet. Something I think churches and church ministries could take note of. I was just reminded the other week, I just, uh, on YouTube, and I just saw something about Ravi Zacharias. Remember Ravi Zacharias? He was perhaps one of the most well-known and respected apologists 
uh, somebody who tr defended and, and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. His ministry, R Ravi Zacharias International Ministries, was, I think, the largest international ap apologetic ministries in the world in terms of how long it had been going and how many countries that it, it had got into. Uh, and when, when we learned about the news about Ravi Zacharias and, and his horrific actions, Ravi Zacharias and, and Ministries uh, uh, and, and initially denied it or, or made very little of it and, were, and, and really wanted to distance themselves. They didn't own up to the fact, not straight away, that what Ravi had done was wrong. It's important for us to own up when we see leaders fall. But the second thing Peter does uh, it's so important, we, we'll look at it separately. He turns to Scripture. Um, you, you see this, is, is obvious in verses 16. Uh, in verse 16, he says, doesn't he, brothers and sisters, the Scripture had to be fulfilled. And then he, he quotes, as we'll see in verse 22, passages from the Old Testament. You see, Peter's actions and his justifications are soaked in Scripture. He goes to God's Word to help him in this moment of crisis. And we'll, as we said... Uh, look at that shortly. But of course, he's going to Scripture. Why? Because at the end of the day, what he's wanting to do is replace Judas. And so he needs not a nomination with credentials to replace Judas. But how do you replace the betrayer? How do you do it? By making it very clear what an apostle is. You see, if, if this person is going to take over Judas's role, you have to make, make, make sure uh, that we know what an apostle is. We need somebody with apostolic credentials to, to join in this apostolic ministry as, as Peter uh, and, the, and the apostles and the people pray in verse 25. So what is an apostle? I wonder whether you've ever asked that question. What is an apostle? Well, in one sense, it's just an apostle is just a messenger, an envoy, a, a herald. But specifically here, an apostle is a leader of this new group of believers and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for them to have this role of leadership... Peter outlines these credentials that you need as an apostle in verses 21 to 22. Just read them with me. We, we see them clearly. It is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. So, so the credentials for an apostle to become part of the 12 was you needed to be there, first of all, from the beginning. Uh, you couldn't have somebody who came in right at the end. Somebody needed to have spent the whole time learning from the Lord Jesus Christ and seeing what he did. So somebody needed to be there at the beginning, but then we learn as well that somebody needed to be there at the end. They needed to have seen the risen Christ. They needed to have seen the ascended Savior. Very specific requirements. Not anybody could be an apostle which should make us very suspicious if somebody calls themselves an apostle today in a way that makes them think that they are a leader over a church, over churches, uh, and have some kind of apostolic authority on a par with these apostles. Absolutely not. It looks like uh, those credentials meant the whole Believers in verse 23 nominated two men. You, you notice that? That they nominated. They got together and they thought, well, these are the credentials. Are the men that fit these credentials? And they find two men. They nominate two men. Joseph called Basabbas, also known as Justice. Basabbas is likely his surname, son of the Sabbath. Justice was his, his Latin name. Uh, and M Matthias. And we know very little with certainty who these men are. Again, in many ways, they're ordinary men. Other than they spent three years with an extraordinary teacher. 
Uh, perhaps, uh, w as one early church historian says, they were part of the 70 or the 72 that went out in, in Luke chapter uh, 10. And perhaps Joseph's brother is the Judas mentioned in Acts 15, verse 22, a different Judas uh, who's also called the son of Bersabbas. But there doesn't really seem to be much that splits between the two of these men. There's no obvious favorite. They've put them forward. So what do they do? What do you do when you have two people who fit the credentials and you, you, you just don't know? Well, what do you do? What did the early church do? Verse 24, they did what came naturally to them. They prayed together. They prayed together. Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs, implying Judas has got his just deserts and his actions have put him where he deserves. But notice this content of prayer, this short prayer, is a heavy reliance on God and his sovereignty, isn't it? That God knows the hearts of these men, and God knows best how important it is to pray for God's help and God's will to be done in a crisis. How important it is to pray for God's help when we're picking and we're choosing new leaders in the church. Uh, then comes what is perhaps the strangest aspect of their decision-making, and uh, not something we see again in Acts, or perhaps I would advise to replicate. They cast lots. We uh, read in verse 26 um, that this, this is something they did. It was, it was actually something fairly common in the Old Testament. Uh, for example, lots were cast for the two goats uh, that would either be used for the sin offering or as the scapegoat in the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16. So it, it was a done thing, but it, it was likely something... Uh, we, we probably have something similar in the, in the, in the idea of drawing a short straw, uh, although that has a negative connotation, doesn't it? So, so this was likely uh, something, uh, probably you have two stones and you write their names on the two stones or, or, or identify whose stone is which and put them in a jar and shake the jar until the first stone falls out. And the first stone that falls out is the winner. Thus, the lot fell to Matthias. I suppose it's a way of choosing between similar people without creating divisions or factions. Uh, but remember again, there was a nomination process first, and there was prayer before this, relying on God's sovereignty. So this wasn't a, a willy-nilly uh, way that, that they, were, they were just leaving to chance. No, this was a soaked, a prayer-soaked reality that meant that they were relying on God's sovereign choice. And so Matthias was added to the 11 apostles. And Acts doesn't mention him again. Which again, I, I think just perhaps is a, is a nod to this, to this reality that in one sense, they're ordinary men. Although one early church historian says he became a missionary to the Ethiopians, we, we're not totally sure whether that is the case. He is in many ways an ordinary man. And yet this whole process shows us how the apostles dealt with the elephant in the room Dealt, dealt with the disgraceful fall of one of their own. They needed to get their house in order if they were going to have a credible witness. They needed to deal with it and, and say to the people that they were witnessing to, we, we've dealt with it. In fact, the whole process shows us that the apostles, like Jesus, thought that the number 12 was important. It was clearly or likely a, a, a clear nod to the 12 tribes of, of Israel, a symbolic way of showing intention and, and in parallel with ethnic Israel that Jesus was the true Israel and these were his children, the disciples were his children, or if you like, the, the, the new patriarchs, the new leaders of this new reorganized and restored spiritual Israel. And you can imagine the number 12 being, uh, coming up in conversation among the Jews in Jerusalem. Why is 12 important? 
because we are part of God's restoration. We are part of God's new beginning in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Come and be a part of a group of ordinary people who did extraordinary things and turned the world upside down. Come and be a part of a group of ordinary people who did extraordinary things, 12 apostles who did extraordinary things because thirdly, they relied on Scripture. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, uh, sorry, I've got a few quotes this morning. Uh, Charles Spurgeon was a famous 19th century pastor, very gifted preacher, uh, who once said of John Bunyan, who was a Puritan in the 17th century, 1600s, uh, wrote Pilgrim's Progress, uh, which, which is probably the most well-read book outside, Christian book outside of the Bible. Uh, he said of John, John Bunyan this, Why, this man is a living Bible! Prick him anywhere, his blood is Bibline. The very essence of the Bible flows from him. He cannot speak without quoting a text, for his very soul is full of the word of God. Isn't that wonderful? He cannot speak without quoting a text. That's a challenge to you and me, isn't it? If we, I don't advise you trying to prick one another after the service, but, 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 but does the very word of God flow from us? You know, I think this applies perfectly to Peter as well in Acts. You see Peter, not just here, but we'll see Peter. He cannot help but quote the Old Testament. In fact, before he quotes the Old Testament, he makes a very important point about the authorship of Scripture in verse 16. I wonder, did you notice it? Just read with me verse 16. Uh, before, you, before we do, let me just have some water. Brothers and sisters... The scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David. You see the significance of that? Here we have uh, from one statement a clear example of what we would call uh, the doctrine of the inspiration of scripture. Through man, though man writes it down, David in this case, he writes it through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is God's book. This is scripture, God's words. So no wonder Peter was relying on it. No wonder we should rely on it. And he says that scripture spoke about Judas' betrayal and, and the need for replacement. In fact, he says that this was fulfillment of scripture, and not in a direct um, prophetic kind of way like Micah 5.2 says that the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem, more in a way that sees the Psalms, and particularly David in the Psalms, and his experiences in the Psalms as pointing to and can be applied to Jesus and his experiences. And so Peter in verse 20 quotes Psalm 69 and verse 25. May his place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in it. It's, it's David praying for God's judgment to be on his enemies. And then Peter quotes as well Psalm 109 verse 8. May another take his place of leadership. And if you read through these Psalms, they are, they are David wrestling with his emotions of fighting his enemies. And, and perhaps even in Psalm 109, uh, in, in Psalm 109's case, fighting uh, somebody who is now his enemy, but somebody who he'd loved. And David is describing how they have hurt him and praying to God that justice would be done as a result. And I think there's no uh, accident that Luke describes Judas's death that speaks of God's judgment. And then Peter then quotes the psalm speaking of God's judgment on Judas. Particularly Psalm 69. And you wonder, I mean, maybe you have asked the question, but, but is this legit? Can, Pete, can Peter do this? Is he just kind of going with the flow and making stuff up? Where, where does he have the right to see Jesus in this psalm or in the psalms? Well, he is the right because Jesus did it. In fact, Jesus quoted this exact psalm, Psalm 69, and applied it to himself. 
You can read that in John 15, verse 25. He quotes Psalm 69, verse 4. But this is to fulfill what is written in the law. They hated me without reason. So Peter is just learning and applying what he learned from the master and seeing that as Jesus sees the Psalms fulfilled in his experience, so does Peter and so should we. We should see in the Psalms, and particularly in David's Psalms, the experiences of the king and apply them to the greater king, the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, that's what Jesus taught his disciples to do. He said in the end of Luke's gospel, he said in chapter 24, verse 44, everything must be fulfilled what is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And here Peter is just doing what he's been taught to do, to lean heavily on God's inspired word. And as he does, we don't just see him quoting scripture, we see him quoting scripture and seeing Jesus in scripture in the Old Testament. And that is something that we have to get used to doing. Are we so soaked in Scripture that we talk about Scripture, that we might perhaps quote Scripture, that we understand Scripture in a way that we see Jesus in the Scriptures? We want to be people like John Bunyan, like Peter, saturated in Scripture, that if somebody pricked us, Scripture would flow from us. And when that happens, ordinary people can do extraordinary things through the word of God. And as ordinary people teach and proclaim and delight in the, in the word of God, we also see the apostles' main purpose in life. Finally and, and shortly, we see that the apostles can do extraordinary things through their resurrection witness. Because at the end of the day, they are a witness. They testify to the truth. Christ is risen. We've seen him, and that fact changes everything. That's one vital credential. Actually, I missed in verse 22, speaking of Matthias or Joseph as nominees to become one of the 12 apostles. We read at the end of verse 22, for one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. That's the purpose of our apostolic ministry. We're, we're witnesses of the resurrection. The apostles turned the world upside down because they were witnesses to the most amazing thing that has ever happened in history. A man who said he would die and rise again, died and rose again. A man who came to be Lord and Savior died on the cross for our sins and rose from the grave to give us life. And although we are not eyewitnesses to this fact, this is the good news we can testify to. If as ordinary people we want to see extraordinary things happen, we need to testify to this truth that he died for our sins and rose from the grave to give us life, that he is risen. Because this message, this truth in the hands of ordinary people like you and me cannot just turn the world upside down. It can turn Dewsbury upside down. It can turn Yorkshire upside down. Because it is the most important and best news you can ever, ever here. And it's the news you need to hear if you're not a Christian here this morning. Christ is risen. Christ is risen and because Christ is alive, he can save you from your rebellion and give you new resurrection life. Life you can taste now through the Spirit, opening up your eyes to the reality of your Savior, um, and life that you will know in fullness and in glory when Christ returns, and we will experience resurrection life together in the new heavens and the new earth. This is good news that means we can know God and have life with Him forever. Good news that continues to turn the world upside down 2,000 years after the apostles. And in many ways, it started in this upper room. It started with these 12 seemingly ordinary men, the apostles leading this little group of ordinary people to do extraordinary things. 
And although the key ingredient of the Holy Spirit is to come, their readiness for prayer, their response to a fallen leader, their reliance on scripture and their resurrection witness meant the world was about to change forever. And it's a change that we have experienced if we're Christians here this morning. And it's wisdom that we can follow if we want to see Dewsbury turned upside down too. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's respond, shall we, before we come to communion through singing. Great is the gospel. Great is the gospel of our glorious God, where mercy met the anger of God's rod. Let's stand to sing, uh, sing and praise uh, God together. sits and as we come into our time of communion we come into our time of communion because of this king of love that we've been singing about communion is a meal uh, that of course points towards a, a greater feast to come the marriage supper of the lamb something uh, we do until the lamb until uh, jesus returns uh, something we proclaim in fact, it's the gospel that we can touch. It's Christ's body broken for us and Christ's blood shed for us. And Christ with us by his spirit as we remember his sacrifice for our sins. And if you can answer yes to these four questions, then, then please join us in, in, in eating the bread and drinking, from the, the, drinking the wine. Are you a Christian? Have you repented and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? as your savior if yes then come 
come and eat, come and drink. And if you're not a Christian, don't feel embarrassed. Just let them pass by and think about this great gospel that we've sung about, this great gospel that we thought about. That's the first question. If you've become a Christian whilst attending our church, have you been baptized? Have you been obedient in baptism? If yes, then come. Third question, if you've fallen out with other Christians, are you reconciled in your relationship with those? reconciled with one another, that you are not in discord with other Christians, that you've forgiven, you've reconciled. If yes, then come. And then fourth, if you're a visitor, are you in good standing and fellowship with your local gospel church? If yes, then come and join us in this wonderful meal. Uh, Our our practice is that we keep the bread until we've got it and then we all eat together and then we keep the the cup until we've all got it and we we drink together. Uh, Before we do, before they're, they're passed out, let me pray to give thanks. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you that we can stop and pause in a busy world with busy lives uh, to remember Christ. And as we remember Christ and as we eat and as we drink, help us to, by your spirit, taste and see that God is good, that Christ is good. To be nourished from the truths of your word as we eat and as we drink. And would you be present through your spirit? Lord, assuring us of the truth that if we're Christians, if that we've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, then Christ has paid it all. Christ is enough. His sacrifice has saved us. And we praise you and thank you for the bread and the, and the wine. Lord, and we give thanks for what they represent. In Christ's name. Amen. 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 It's usually our practice for elders to serve. It's a way of elders to serve, but we're, we're quite short on elders this morning. So I'm wondering whether a couple of deacons can help. I'm wondering whether Pete and Deborah, whether you could help as deacons to serve the, the bread uh, and the wine. So first of all, if, if with Colin, whether you can help serve the bread, that would be really helpful. Everybody got some bread? Let's eat together.
I serve the cup. Again, if Peter and Deborah could help. Everybody got a cup? Let's drink and remember Christ together. Amen. Let's finish uh, this part of the service by singing again as we're reflecting upon Jesus and reflecting upon his death. Let's sing, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued. Let's stand and sing about this amazing love together.
He sits. Now, for those joining us on catch up, that's the end of the service. Thank you very much for watching.